So in the next uh, 40 to 45 minutes, I would like to present you some of the work I have been um, doing throughout my PhD at, uh, at IST Austria. So what I will uh, talk about is to a large extent joint work with uh, my advisors, uh, Jonathan Sprer and Uli Wagner. But I will also present some results which have not yet been published apart from my PhD thesis. So I would like to start with a quick uh, overview of the talk, um, which is uh, best uh, through the title. So I will in the first, so the talk has two parts, and in the first part of the talk, uh, I will briefly review triangulations and uh, their dual graphs of three manifolds. Then I would also like to talk about the context and the motivation of our work, which is mainly algorithms and computation. Then I would like to illustrate some width parameters, uh, which appear to be very important in this context. And then in the second part of the talk, I would like to present uh, an overview of the results, which are mainly quantitative relationships between these with parameters of different natures. And not too in detail, but, but I will also talk a bit about the methods and the tools, which are with generalized Haggard splittings. So the main objects of interest in this uh, research uh, are three-dimensional manifolds. And as you know, a three-manifold is just a topological space that locally looks like our three-dimensional space. Now, in this talk, we only consider compact and orientable three-manifolds. And there is a classical result by Moise that every such three-manifold has a triangulation. And what do uh, we mean by that? Uh, just take finitely many tetrahedra and glue them together along pairs of triangular faces. So here is an example of gluing two tetrahedra together. So you have pick two tetrahedra, your favorite face, you choose an identification and just glue them together. And uh, importantly, we also allow uh, multiple pairs of faces on the same tetrahedra to be identified. And we also allow such self-identifications when the two triangles from the same tetrahedron are identified with each other. So sometimes it is useful if we forget a little bit about the exact gluing structure of our triangulation, and we just want to keep information about which pairs of tetrahedra are glued together uh, to each other, and the dual graph does precisely that. So it's a graph where we take one vertex for each tetrahedron and one edge for each face gluing. And this is a multigraph with vertex degrees at most four. Now, also we consider two three manifolds uh, the same if they are homeomorphic. And just one uh, uh, quick remark. So a triangulation as presented here is in general, not a simple shell complex, but if this bothers you, you can always turn it into one by taking at most two barycentric subdivisions. All right. So the problem, uh, the main problem which gives us the context is uh, the algorithmic study of three manifolds. So essentially all the questions which we have investigated uh, are ultimately motivated by this. And the, the root of the problem is that when you study uh, three manifolds, which are topological objects, but you study them by a computer, you need to choose a combinatorial representation, a triangulation, for example. But for every uh, three manifold, you have infinitely many ways of doing so, right? And in fact, algorithmically deciding, for instance, whether two given triangulations are homeomorphic is, is a non-trivial problem. Now, having said that, there are striking differences between uh, various dimensions. For instance, in dimension two, 
if you have two surfaces, two triangulated surfaces, and you would like to decide whether they are homeomorphic, you just compute the Euler characteristic, check the orientability, and you're done. In dimension three, you can also, um, so there is, there exists an algorithm, but it's really, really complicated. It relies on Perelman's solution to the geometrization conjecture, and of course on the work of many others. And obviously it has not been implemented. So what happens in dimension three, typically, in practice, that, that uh, people try to classify or distinguish three manifolds by computing various structures and various invariants on, on the triangulation. And this brings us closer to the more direct motivation, which is algorithmic efficiency. And the, here the challenge is that many invariants, which are useful for telling three-dimensional manifolds apart, are quite difficult or expensive to compute. Often there are hardness results that they are MP hard to compute. And that means that in general one cannot hope for polynomial time algorithms. However, it turns out that taking into structural properties of the triangulation, the input triangulation, one can uh, take big advantage in the computations. So one such property is the tree bit of a triangulation, of the dual graph, in fact. Uh, for now, I would like to delay a little bit the discussion of tree width and uh, just present you some algorithms and their running times. So please don't get uh, lost in this, this table. Um, but I would like to highlight that in the middle column, if you look at the middle column, then uh, the number of tetrahedra always appears as a linear factor, and all the bad, bad exponential stuff uh, is, is separated from it. So if you fix, if you, if you restrict your attention to triangulations where the tree width is fixed or bounded, then all these algorithms have linear running time. This is why they are, are called fixed parameter tractable. And uh, these results are not only theoretical results, but but uh, um, several of these algorithms have been implemented in software packages, and they also provide actually practical tools for computational topologists. So the presence of such algorithms uh, motivates the main guiding question in this research, namely, given a three-manifold M, how small the tree width of uh, the dual graph of any triangulation can be. Is there a universal upper bound, or are there three manifolds for which this number is arbitrarily large? So this is the main, main guiding question for us. OK, so now let me discuss the tree width of a graph briefly. So informally, the tree width of a graph quantifies the similarity of G to a tree. And uh, the definition is a little bit cumbersome, so I would like to illustrate this concept by examples. So as you would expect, the tree width of a tree is 1. And note that this concept uh, does not uh, sense multiple edges or loops, so they, they will never increase or change the tree width. At the other end of the spectrum, the tree width of the complete graph is n minus 1 on n vertices. But you can get actually uh, everything in between, um, most notably, or not most notably, but interestingly, if you take a, a k by k grid, that will have a tree with k. And uh, that also shows that you can have arbitrary high tree width even among planar graphs. So this, uh, many of you, I think are familiar with this concept, and you know that it has been a key concept in theoretical computer science, 
most notably in graph minor theory. Um, it is also one of the cornerstones of parameterized complexity theory, as we have seen some examples in the previous slide. And um, of course, over the decades, people have considered various different kind of width parameters that capture the structure of a graph in one way or another. And today there is really a zoo of such parameters one can study and uh, try to relate to each other. All right, so we have discussed briefly the tree width of a graph. So what is the tree width of a three manifold? And in order to uh, introduce that, I would like to uh, just restate the main question of of, the, uh, of us, so or, or for us. So given a three manifold M, how small can the tree width of a dual graph B. So this uh, question also guides us to the definition. Namely, we just take the smallest possible value. And that's it. So the tree width of a three manifold is defined to be the smallest tree width of the dual graph of any triangulation thereof. And note that this way we can actually turn any uh, non-negative graph parameter into a topological invariant for three manifolds. We call these collectively topologic uh, combinatorial width parameters. So one could consider the path width of a manifold, the cut width of a manifold, the congestion of a manifold, also known as the carving width, and so on and so forth. Now, if you define uh, invariance this way, by minimizing over an infinite family, there is always the caveat that the definition does not offer a direct pathway of computing this, uh, of computing uh, um, these, these invariants. So, and actually this is a very interesting and difficult question, how would you compute such invariants? Uh, but, uh, during this talk, I would like to focus on a different approach. So, what we were trying to do is uh, understanding the quantitative relation between the tree width and other combinatorial width parameters and classical topological invariants of three manifolds like the Hagar genus or the hyperbolic volume. So this was one of the main themes which we were pursuing um, during my PhD. So I believe that some of you are uh, familiar with the notion of the Hagar genus of a three manifold, but I would like to briefly review this concept because it is uh, of central importance. So first of all, um, a handle body of genus G is just a solid body with G holes. So here you can see the first few examples. For now, let us assume that, that the manifolds are connected, orientable, and closed, meaning they are compact and they don't have a boundary component. And there is a classical result that every such three manifold can be obtained as a Hagard splitting, meaning two handle bodies of the same genus glued together along their boundary components. For example, here M is constructed by taking two genus two handle bodies, and they are identified along their boundary via a homeomorphism F1. But maybe it is possible to build F from two solid tori by identifying them along their boundary. And if this is the smallest possible uh, genus, then we say that M is of Hagar genus one. So the Hagar genus is really the minimum genus of any Hagar splitting of the manifold. All right, so, so now um, um, having discussed some of the concepts, I would like to present results. So our first result was motivated by the quest for three manifolds with large three width. So what we uh, managed to establish with uh, Jonathan and Uli, that if you take a closed orientable 
irreducible and non Haken 3 manifold. Then it's Hagar genus and the trivet satisfy the following inequality. Namely, uh, the Hagar genus is at most 18 times the tree width plus one. So if you don't know what a non Haken, uh, if you know what a non Haken three manifold is, then it's of course great. If you don't know, that's also fine for now. Um, what makes this result uh, um, useful or uh, what enables us to apply this result is 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 another result by by Egol, uh, who showed at the beginning of the 21st century that there exist precisely such three manifolds. I mean, closed, orientable, irreducible, and importantly non-Hakan three manifolds that have arbitrary large Hagar genus. And if we combine this result of Egol with our result, then we can also immediately deduce that there exist uh, three manifolds for which the tree width is arbitrarily large. So subsequently, uh, we also managed to establish a reverse inequality, namely upper bounding the tree width in terms of the Hagar genus. And here we do not require the manifolds uh, to be non haken And actually, these two theorems yield the corollary that for non haken manifolds, the tree width and the Hagar genus are in fact within a constant factor of each other. And you can see that these constants are quite explicit. So, so very explicitly quantified. Uh, all right, so at the, in this context, in this context, I would also like to mention uh, a related result in uh, knot theory due to uh, Arnold de Mesme, Jessica Purcell, Saul Schleimer, and Eric Sedgwick. Uh, they showed that for every natural number, there exists a knot where the, the tree width of the knot is at least n. Now, there is a subtle difference here they consider the tree width to be the minimum tree width of any knot diagram of the knot and this is different uh, from related but it's different from from what uh, we consider we consider the tree width of uh, the the dual graph of a triangulation all right um, so we have seen that there are three manifolds with arbitrary large tree width and uh, that also brings us to the following question, namely, what can we say about three manifolds at the other end of the spectrum, those that have very small tree width? And to present our results uh, here, first I would like to recall another result, early resu earlier result, another early 21st century result by Jaco and Rubinstein, uh, who did not phrase their theorem exactly this way, but essentially what they showed, that if you take a closed orientable three manifold with Hagar genus at most one, then the tree width of that manifold is also at most one. And this is shown by exhibiting a tree with one triangulation for those manifolds that have Hagar genus at most one that looks like this um, sequence of, I don't know, sausages. So what we did is uh, we, 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 we turned, we, we asked the question, what happens? What happens if you turn this around? Um, so, and we, we managed to show that that it is it is uh, almost reversible the, this theorem up to a single up to a single counterexample. So, okay, let let me read the theorem aloud. So so take take a closed orientable three manifold, mm -hmm. which has three width at most one. 
then either the Hagar genus of this manifold is also at most one, or M is a very concrete, very specific ciphered fibered space that has Hagar genus too. And essentially the, the, the proof, the key of the proof is a simple observation which says that if you take a four regular graph that has three with at most one, then it looks like as one of these three graphs presented above. So it has a, it has a, it has a quite a quite linear structure. And then you have to start looking at these manifolds um, more carefully, see what happens if you start stacking tetrahedra on top of each other. And uh, it turns out that you can um, control, keep the situation under control. And in the end, uh, it works out. Um, and the, ex the exceptional case, this exceptional cipher fiber space occurs at the second case, where you have just two tetrahedra glued together in a funky way along their boundary. All right. So, so based on this uh, uh, theorem, we could also deduct some further corollaries uh, for the results, namely, uh, we could show that for quite a large class of three manifolds, namely orientable ciphered fiber spaces over the sphere or a non-orientable surface, we can also exhibit three with two triangulations. And uh, since they are, they do not belong to the previous class. Uh, namely, they have typically Hager genus higher than one. That means that their uh, three width is actually equal to. And somehow this was sufficient to show that most of those three manifolds that have triangulation with at most 10 tetrahedra have three width also at most two. And interestingly, it turns out that, that minimal triangulations are not always of minimum three width. And this question, this relationship is not yet well understood, but, but it is, I think it is a very interesting question uh, to understand up to what extent are minimal triangulations uh, also minimal in three width, and if they are not, then what happens? Um, at this point, I think I, I should also mention that while uh, theorem three can be uh, proven by hand, uh, we really, really made uh, great use of this uh, software called Regina, which is a very useful uh, graphical uh, tool for analyzing uh, mostly three, but not exclusively three manifold triangulations. And it really helped us to do the bookkeeping and to to really uh, keep things under control. So I arrive now at the last section of the results part before moving on to the methods. So this last result I would like to uh, flesh out concerns the family of a huge, huge family of hyperbolic three manifolds. So a three manifold is uh, hyperbolic if it is obtained uh, as a quotient of the hyperbolic space by a discrete uh, isometric group. And one of the striking and mind-boggling properties of hyperbolic manifolds is that uh, their topology already determines their geometry, informally speaking, which is a consequence of this uh, so-called most of rigidity theorem. For example, the volume of a hyperbolic manifold is a topological invariant, and as such, it makes sense to ask how it relates to other invariants of a three manifold, for example, to the three width. And this is uh, precisely what uh, Clement and Jessica Purcell uh, asked. 
and they showed that uh, for such a three manifold the volume always gives an upper bound on the three bit in terms of uh, some uh, constant that can be quantified so in theorem 5 we strengthen this result by by showing that there exists a universal constant such that for a closed um, hyperbolic three manifold m the volume upper bounds even the path width of a of the manifold which could a priori be much larger than the tree width at least this is the case for graphs and it is a very interesting open question as far as i know for three manifolds and so for the proof of this result we follow a similar agenda as uh, clement and jessica uh, there are some uh, differences in between the two toolboxes and I'm, i might talk about this a bit later okay so so this was an overview of of, of the results um, and now i would like to to talk a bit about the proofs and the methods um, without going into too much details so i i hope i hope that it will make sense so so the proof proof of theorem one how, how does it go so so let me uh, briefly uh, recall uh, the theorem so what we have is that we have a, a closed uh, orientable irreducible and non-harken three manifold and we would like to show that the tree width of this manifold gives an upper bound on its Hagar chickens so the heart of the proof is a procedure that takes a triangulation as an input and converts it into a Hagar splitting with small genus in a way where the genus of the splitting is controlled by the tree width of the triangulation we start with so if you have studied a little bit of three manifold topology probably there is a method which comes immediately into your mind there is a very well known construction basic construction that turns a three manifold triangulation into a so called handle decomposition if you just thicken up the pieces of the triang of your triangulation so here um, I mean, we call this uh, the canonical handle decomposition corresponding to the triangulation. You take a three ball for the interior of each tetrahedron. You also take a three-dimensional ball that corresponds to the interior of a triangular face. You, you, you build your manifold from three-dimensional solid balls, but these handles, they just differ uh, they, they look like your triangulation, the pieces of your triangulation, but they are just a bit thicker than that. And they are glued together according the, according the pieces of the triangulation, right? So, it is not difficult to convince yourself that if you take the union of the zero handles and the one handles, which, by the way, is just like a thickened version of the dual graph, you get a handle body. And on the other hand, if you take the union of the two handles and the three handles, which is like a thickened version of the one skeleton of your triangulation, you also get a handle body. These two have the same genus, so you can glue them together to form the manifold, and this way you get the Hagar splitting right the, there is a tiny small problem with this construction that if your triangulation 
has n tetrahedron, then this construction will yield a Hegard splitting with splitting surface of dimension n plus one. Right, and and this is this is this is this is too large. This grows linearly with the number of tetrahedra. Somehow, the need to bring in to play the fact, the assumption that uh, that our three manifold has some bounded tree width. So, in order to do this, we have to work not with Hegard splittings, but so-called generalized Hegard splittings. And so I would like to give you a, a very brief introduction to this to this uh, machinery, which was uh, pioneered at the beginning of the 1990s uh, by Charlemagne and Thompson, and more recently it was uh, systematized and in a very nice textbook by Charlemagne Schultens and Saito. So what is going on here? So we will work with a very concrete example of the three-dimensional torus, which is um, you, take, you take a solid ball and you, you glue together the opposite, uh, the opposite faces of it. So similarly as before, we could start building up this torus from, from handles. So the most natural way you would you would build up this three-dimensional torus. So first we can take a single ball and it, it appears to be eight balls but of course after the identifications these balls this is only one ball right. Uh, I would also like to keep track of the genus of the boundary surface during this procedure of building up the torus from handles. So of course if you take a, if you take a, a single ball, then the, the, then the boundary of this uh, is just a sphere which it has genus zero. Right. So now we attach the first one handle. That increases the genus by one. Then we take another two handle, uh, sorry, another one handle, which increases the genus also by one, and another one. At this point, we face a handle body of genus uh, three. Now we start gluing in so-called two handles to close these windows. And these gluings, they start decreasing the genus of the boundary surface. And at the very last step, we fill in the void by gluing in a solid ball. And then, then the boundary of our manifold disappears. Now what we did this way, we actually constructed a Hegard splitting of genus 3. And one of the central ideas of generalized Hegard splittings is that by exchanging the attaching order of these handles, one handles with two handles, often you can reduce the genus of the intermediate bounding surfaces during the procedure and doing so is, is very beneficial in many cases. So, so let's start over this construction and let's see what we can do. So we can, of course, we, we have to start somehow. We start with a, a zero handle. We have to attach the first one handle and then another one. But note at, that at this point, we already see one of these windows which we can fill by gluing in a two handle and here I record this with two ones because at this point if you look at the picture for some time you can realize that we have two torus boundary components here inside you see he, inside 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 this this uh, whatever object we have 
we have two torus boundary components, which we now connect with a tube, so we get a single boundary component of genus 2. But again, now we can also glue in uh, a two-handle, another two-handle, and finally fill in the void. And what we say is that this way we obtain a generalized Haggard splitting of width 2-2, two, two, which correspond to the two local maximas uh, highlighted in red color. And uh, this way we can compare Haggard splitting, generalized Haggard splittings. We can compare the width of a generalized Haggard splitting um, of, or of two generalized Haggard splittings by lexicogra lexicographic order. And we say that the lexicographical mi lexicographically minimal width, we say that it is in thin position. And generalized Haggard splittings in thin position have, as, as we, will, we will see very soon, have, have some very useful properties. So that's, that was a brief primer on generalized Haggard splittings, one of the, the main uh, tools which we have been working with. Now let's see how we can apply this construction in the context of theorem 1. So again, we have a closed, orientable, irreducible, and non-Haken 3-manifold of a given 3-width. We would like to construct a small genus Haggard splitting. So what we will do is that we will actually construct a small genus generalized Haggard splitting by first pre-processing the, the the graph, the dual, the dual graph of, of, of the input triangulation. So what is going on? What are the key steps? So first, of course, we have to start somewhere. We take a triangulation of our three manifold that has minimal genus, uh, minimal tree width, that achieves the tree width of the manifold. Uh, according to a result by Bienstock from 1990. If you have a small tree with uh, triangulation, then you can always turn it into a low congestion graph layout. So, so what we see on the bottom left is that uh, the leaves of the tree, they correspond to the vertices of, of, of our original graph. So H, H is uh, some, some binary tree. And uh, each edge of the original graph, gamma T, is, is, is rooted along the unique path between the two leaves that correspond to the endpoints of that edge. And this way, we get a graph layout. Um, it can, of course, there are many choices for routing, uh, the, for, for mapping, mapping the vertices um, of, of the graph into the leaves of the tree. Um, and what does it mean that this layout has low congestion? That the number of times an edge of the host tree is used is bounded in terms of the tree width of the original graph. Now, this low congestion layout actually gives us a template to construct a generalized Haggard splitting. And that was, uh, was our, our main contribution. And not only to construct a generalized Haggard splitting, but to construct it in a way that these uh, bounding surfaces, uh, which we saw in the previous slide, these SI, have genus bounded above uh, by the tree width of the triangulation we started with. And now here comes uh, 
the 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 magic of 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 uh, Charlemagne and Thompson. What we can do is that we can bring this generalized Hegard splitting into thin position, which will not increase the genus of uh, the intermediate bounding surfaces. It might even reduce, uh, get rid of them. And uh, Charlemagne and Thompson, they also showed, and this is the only point where the non hakenness assumption of the manifold comes in. So, so Charlemagne and Thompson, they also show that if you have a non haken uh, manifold, then a generalized Hegard splitting, which is in thin position, has to be a classical Hegard splitting. And the procedure did not increase the genus of the bounding surfaces. And therefore, the splitting surface in this thin Hegard splitting is still bounded above by the three bit of the triangulation. And this way, we can conclude our, the, our result. Or con conclude the proof. So this this is uh, this is basically it. Of course, there are some details which uh, concern the step between two and three that I did not talk about, and and of course the the Charlemagne Thompson theory is also an elaborate theory. Yeah. So, the, but this is the high-level overview, uh, and the time is 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 very uh, limiting by now. So, I would just very briefly flesh out a similar figure for the proof of theorem five, in which we show that there exists a universal constant such that for a closed hyperbolic three-manifold, the path width is upper bounded by the hyperbolic volume. And what we do here is that we, we invoke a um, known and yeah, well, actually well known classical results from, from th three, three manifold topology. Um, and we just have to connect them in the appropriate way. So what happens is that we start with the hyperbolic three manifold M. Um, first, we don't we don't start with a, a triangulation, but what we do we construct a so-called thick thin decomposition, um, which somehow decomposes the manifold into a thick part and several thin parts, which in our case are just solid tori glued in somehow into the manifold. And by um, the result of, of Kobayashi and Rick, we can, and also Jorgens and Thurston, we can um, triangulate this um, thick thin decomposition. At the same time, it also yields a generalized Hegard splitting. And we know that, that all of these bounding surfaces, um, except, for, except for, for S1, will be, will be of, of, uh, of genus 1. And S1 is also bounded in the terms of the number of triangulations. Now, once we have a generalized Hegard splitting, there is a procedure called amalgamation to turn this into a classical Hegard splitting by connecting, yeah, maybe connecting is not the best best word to say, by by um, somehow collapsing and merging together these these uh, these bounding surfaces, and this can also be done in a controlled way. So we get actually a Hegard splitting at step three where the genus of the splitting is bounded above by the volume. And we have seen uh, that if we have 
a Haggard splitting of bounded genus, then we can invoke the Jacob Rubenstein machinery uh, of layer triangulations to construct a small uh, path width uh, triangulation as well. So, all right, this was 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 uh, very high level, and I think I have uh, run out of time. So. Unfortunately, the weather is not as nice as in this picture, but nevertheless, I would like to thank you for your attention and bon appetit.